Blah, 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 blah. Welcome to the Our Forever Smiles podcast, a podcast created to support mothers of children who were born with clefts and those who love them. I'm your host, Laura Arroyo, and I'm also a mother of a daughter who was born with a surprise cleft palate. I know the challenges you face every day, whether you have just learned the difficult news of your baby's cleft lip or palate, you're in the midst of pre-op or post-op, or you're an OG cleft mom. This podcast is for you. In a weekly conversation, we will talk about everything from feeding and speech therapy to surgery and school. We'll share tips from guest experts and advocates and even share a little joy in the process. You can listen to Our Forever Smiles wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned. Hello, welcome back to the Our Forever Smiles Clef Mom Diaries and Support Podcast. I am Laura Arroyo. Thank you to all of our subscribers, new and old. I appreciate all of the support that we've received from this wonderful community. You can listen via Apple, Spotify, and everywhere that podcasts are available. Don't forget to subscribe if you have not yet and stay tuned. As a note, we are not medical doctors and we do not intend for you to use this information that we share as medical advice. We are parents and advocates who love our children, and we're sharing our own personal experiences. So just be mindful of that as you listen. I am actually going to talk about Giselle's 15-month and checkup and her last post-op check-in. We were basically told that she needed to be evaluated by speech. So um, as our family is in North Carolina, so we went to UNC. Um, UNC is different and that they like refer you to the county, which I thought was really weird um, to for all of like speech services. So we just decided to uh, call another place that they referred us to to have her evaluated for the first time. And based on their findings, they say that they are not recommend recommending speech at this time. They're probably um, thinking that it's too early. But she's at least like trending in the right direction. They want to they want her to have at least 50 words by the time she is 18 months. And they would like to see her use two syllable words where the letters of the different syllables are different. So, for example, like sister or like belly versus they often see children that are struggling with speech say things like it's easy for them to say like mama or they want to hear children say bottle versus Baba. And that's something that we're going to be working on. Obviously, she's so young, so some words are just going to be like unclear. But what they care about the most at this age is the attempt. So even if she is not, she says belly a lot. That's why I said that. But even if she's not saying like belly clearly, if she's changing the two syllables, that's a good sign. So what she says actually is mebby, but they are seeing that there's a change. She's saying M for the B and B for L in the middle. So there's an attempt there. <laughs> it was good news. We'll have her reevaluated once she gets closer to 18 months, which is what they recommended. But my next concern a little bit with her is that she doesn't have any teeth. She has two teeth and then she hasn't grown anymore. So we're going to definitely ask the doctors about what is going on with that and if we should be expecting something more teeth sooner or later. I don't know. I just see a lot of children with way more teeth at her age. I I feel like after I say this, like tomorrow, she's going to grow three more teeth or something and it's it's just totally going to backfire. She's going to start biting me or something. But no. So once I get uh, more information about that, I'll be happy to share an update. But that's enough about me today. We have a Wonderful and beautiful guests all the way from, I believe it's Sarnia, Ontario in Canada. Uh, Sarah Rogers is here. She's a professional photographer and artist, and she is the mother of two teenagers. God bless her. And an eight-month-old baby girl. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, Laura. Thank you for having me. So, Sarah, oh, first of all, what made you decide to start over with children? <laughs> 
I went through a pretty nasty divorce 10 years ago and I'm just starting all over again now that my kids are a little older and everything's a little easier. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. That's wonderful. My fiance is about 10 years older than me. So he has older children and he has, his son is 25. His daughter is six and my daughter is Oh my goodness, I just blanked. 15 months. I just said this. She's 15 months. And so he has a 25-year-old and a 15-month-old, which I find very funny. He's wanted three children and he's very happy with that. And so everyone always asks what was the motivation to start over. And But he's definitely, the shop is definitely closed. And so were you looking to have more children or was this something that came as a surprise to you? What was your journey like in getting pregnant or becoming pregnant? My boyfriend doesn't have any besides the one that we have now. So he really wanted kids. And I was on the fence like I could go either way. I'm still on that fence a little bit. Getting up there in age. I'm almost 38 now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So... It's I'm almost the same, right? Because my my we're almost the same. My my fiance had two. I didn't have any. And so I was like, I could go either way. But it was I was comfortable in not having additional like children after her because she has siblings, right? She has a brother (laughs) and a sister. And then also he mentioned to me very early on in our relationship that he um, you know, that he was also getting older and that he would be willing to have one more child, but he didn't want to have anything beyond that, except for after we had Giselle, my, that's my daughter, he was, he suddenly became willing again to have more. But, so, yeah. Someday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so... Did you find out what you were having through the NIPT testing or was it through your regular like scan that you had? Regular scan. Okay. And when did you find out that your baby was cleft affected? About 20 weeks. I think I was 22 weeks actually. It was, I had the ultrasound and In Canada, they don't give you the results right away. The doctor has to give you the results at your next appointment. So I had a little bit of a waiting period after I had the scan. And then the doctor just laid it on me. And it, it really hits you when you first get told, right? Because every mother wants the best for their baby wants their baby to be perfect, which we all know that's not possible to be perfect. It really hits you like a ton of bricks when you're pregnant, full of hormones. That first week when you first find out that your baby has cleft is really hard. Yeah. Did you find out the gender and the, was this all news all in one day? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And now did they do, in Canada, do they wait to tell you... Was it just because because she was lip affected or she was cleft affected? Is that the reason why they waited? Or if they're just trying to find the gender, do they tell you right then and there like how they do here in the States? No, the uh, ultrasound tech isn't allowed to tell you anything. They really mm-hmm. get you hanging a little bit. Just a normal ultrasound kind of makes you uneasy a little bit because they don't tell you anything at the ultrasound. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do they like move the screen so you can't see it? Because. Yes. Yeah. At the starting, you're not allowed to see anything and they do all the measures. What? So, yeah. And then once I did find out that she had cleft, I had to go to a different city for a depth to see if she had palate or anything else going on. And. That's when I really got information and got to sit and talk to an ultrasound tech that knew what she was talking about with the cleft, especially because she had seen a lot of ultrasounds with cleft. So, oh, wow. They they told me that there was no palate involved and they were like sure of it. So that was a lot of weight off my shoulder with that. Because all mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about cleft until I got pregnant with a cleft affected baby. Yeah, same. I 
my daughter was I didn't know until my daughter was actually born. So it was like really oh. I was totally Yeah, I was totally unprepared. Yeah, she was just palate affected, so that's why they couldn't see it on the ultrasound. But it's interesting though, they were able to tell you about the palate during that appointment or you said that they were yeah. sure that they were sure like they told me like you were absolutely sure she doesn't have palate affected and they were okay. really worried because my boyfriend had club foot when he was born so mm-hmm. they were looking for everything they were worried she might have club foot and stuff too so yeah hmm, that's interesting so but and then she was palate affected right when she was born no she just had lip oh just lip okay for some reason i thought that she was both lip and palate affected but that's fascinating yeah that they were able to tell did do you remember what kind of testing they did to determine that no but i had an ultrasound that lasted three hours that day oh my goodness yeah so it was a bit grueling just laying there. I'm sure for her, too. Yeah. She was probably being, like, <laughs> both lived in. <laughs> she no. was probably, oh. like, <laughs> I'm trying to sleep, guys. Like, <laughs> I, I got a really good, clear view. They wouldn't let me take pictures, either. It's really weird how weird they are about privacy in that ultrasound here in Canada. I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, here in the, I'm, I don't know, I don't know anything about Canada, so I, I don't assume that you would know much here about, about in the United States either, but you're, you basically get two. If you're having a normal pregnancy, you just have your, your first scan, like your ultrasound. It's usually, I think, I want to say it's 10 weeks. And then you have the, like a 20 week scan, which is your anatomy scan. And that's when they tell you, they usually tell you the gender. And then, but you can also find out through genetic testing what the gender of the baby is as well. And then you, it's radio silence after that. You have your appointments and stuff, but that's pretty much all the scans that they do if you are not a high risk, if you're not having a high risk pregnancy. And so um, for me, there was very little information that was shared because technically, I mean, I wasn't having a high risk pregnancy. I had no issues aside from the fact that I just didn't like being pregnant in general. But I just complained a lot. But I I just had that. Reg- we did get the NIPT testing. The only other thing that was unique is that we did not want to know the gender of the baby until she was born. So we didn't know that we were having a girl. So we had two surprises. We had this. She was cleft affected. And then also that we were having a girl. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really fun. But so, yeah, whenever you found out about. Your daughter being cleft affected. Were you by yourself? Yes. When I found out the f- with my doctor and then the mm-hmm. first person I talked to was my significant other. Yeah. And so how, what was their reaction? I was already like really emotional in my pregnancy. So I was just like crying. Like I failed. Like I thought I didn't mm. think I definitely blame myself. I was like, oh, I didn't take enough prenatal vitamins. That was the big one. And I'm old. That's why I, I, I'm not actually old. Well, you beat yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. You. The doctor is classified. I remember talking to my coworker and she's I think she's 36. And she's yeah, because I'm having a geriatric pregnancy. <laughs> they do treat you that too they treat you that way for real (laughs) yeah so i can imagine all how all of those feelings came um and i i like there's like there were i always say there were good things and bad things of me not knowing had i known maybe i would have beat myself up more about like the situation more than what i needed to but i guess after um, you know, going through your pregnancy and finally going to deliver labor and delivery. What what was that like? What how was your labor? It uh, I had a C section, so a little bit different. And I was awake for the C section. As soon as I laid eyes on her, it was like it all melted away. Every hmm. single worry and 
everything. I was just fell in love. It's love at first sight with your child. Yeah. No yes. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So did you plan to have a, was it a plan C-section or did, were you like rushed in like, like the movies? No, it was a planned one because it was my third C-section. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Okay. So whenever you like, I'm sure during the time, like before you gave birth, you had lots of conversations with medical professionals about feeding and just next steps for when the baby when your daughter was going to arrive. Right. I've talked to so many mothers that said there were like 50 people in the room because they like had not seen anything like this in their lives. And it was just it was like so dramatic and stuff. So <laughs> I know that there's like a team of people that care and that really want to make sure that your baby can get what they need as soon as they're born. So what was like the prep on the medical side for that? We had to go out of town and we have our own what they call a cleft team in, mm -hmm. in london ontario and yeah it was like that maybe not 50 people but they have other cleft patients there they're familiar with cleft and they got us in a room and gave us the big speech and it honestly worried me more because they made it sound like i wouldn't be able to breastfeed and how hard it would be to feed her breast milk that was one of my biggest concerns was the breastfeeding and the breast milk because I hadn't breastfed successfully with my other two weren't cleft affected. So I was really hoping to do it this time. Yeah. That was my really big concern. So that they really made it seem like you're probably not going to be able to. So you need to be prepared. And it was a blessing that they did that because it really made me want to do it more. They prepared, were they like saying this before they were born, before your daughter was born? Or did they like, were they pushing this on you after she was born or, or both? Before. So they were like, before. We never see cleft babies successfully breastfeed. You're like, you can try. If she's not getting enough, you're going to have to give her breast milk that you either expressed or formula and they really pounded it in my head that I wouldn't be able to breastfeed and be prepared so mm. that is exactly what I did was prepare <laughs> <laughs> and who stepped in after she was born did when they put her on your chest to I assume they put her on your chest did you just initiate that or did you have the lactation consultant who initiated this breastfeeding relationship it was definitely me i was very educated i made sure i researched the hell out of it <laughs> skin skin contact was really important for me and i talked about it with my doctor before my c-section and he agreed that he would give the baby skin to coat skin to skin contact sorry about that right as soon as i had her my hubby held her for me on me while i'm laying the thing no it was yeah we got a picture of it it's really cute and did she latch immediately uh or did you have to work at it yes i had to work at it for sure the latch i think with her lip because she had the gap that breast kind of filled the gap in a little bit and it was actually easier than a bottle would have been mm -hmm. bottle you would have had to angle it or fill in her gap whereas my breast kind of just fell into her gap and filled it so it was almost easier that way for me anyway yeah, it provided more of a seal. Right. Um, yeah, I could see how that would work better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had really, I had great intentions on breastfeeding, but just like ge in general, my personality is very like if it works, if it doesn't, like I try not to like really like worry or, or beat myself up about things, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try my hardest, right? I'm not like some of the someone that just okay it didn't work like 
I'm going to try my hardest. And if it doesn't work out, then I'm okay. Like I tried, I gave it all that I could. Um, because my daughter was pallet affected, it's a lot different because um, I've heard people say that they have gotten their baby that is pallet affected to latch. However, right. based on what I've seen with my daughter and just in like my experience, I stopped trying because I felt like I wasn't I was doing her more harm than I was good in trying like I was. Really, she wasn't getting the calories that she needed. She was working really hard. And they were basically, they basically looked me right in my face and told me what the same thing that they tell all mothers. Listen, you're not going to be able to breastfeed. Children that have cleft palates, can, they cannot form suction. Right. And so they need a feeding mechanism in order to be able to get the milk that they need. And so... That was like, a, I was a little bit taken aback by that because I was having other people tell me conflicting information, but it was mm. people that didn't really know or understand what clefts were. So it was just a lot of different conflicting messaging in terms of breastfeeding for me. And I, I maybe I would have tried like other um, methods. I did have a lactation consultant come in to talk to me about it. Um, but by then I was so like taken aback by the whole situation I, that I wasn't expecting that I just said, you know what, whatever is easiest for both of us is what I'm going to do. And, um, my job here is to make sure that she gets fed in general. I'm just going to try to get her to feed. But yeah, um, I don't know. Like I, I'm not sure like the specifics of like the questions that to ask for for something like that but I guess what if I'm a mom that is trying to breastfeed my child that is lip affected what's the steps that I should take to be able to do that well first of all you have to have a lot of determined determination for sure because I was mm -hmm. determined and that really helped I had everything prepared so that if I failed, I wasn't going face first. I had a pump that was hospital grade, which really makes a good difference. And I was pumping while I was trying to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. So I had that breast milk to fall back on. And if I couldn't breastfeed, I was going to continue to pump and still offer her my breast milk. I didn't feel as guilty in my own shortcomings for a lack of word <laughs> yeah and then in terms of like positioning what's the best like positioning to have your baby in or any like practical tips that you would give someone that's trying to breastfeed that's definitely a big factor because one side is definitely stronger than the other unless they have bilateral I don't know what that's like but mm -hmm. had the one side, so she was stronger on the one side. And now my one boob is at least a size or two bigger than the other one. <laughs> she definitely prefers this one. <laughs> she had the right side, and she prefers what would be my left side. And Oh, wow. But worked for her best. And I just think it would be different for anybody because of where the positioning would be would be the main factor i would think and would you recommend that they seek a lactation consultant or yeah. um someone in the hospital that's like pro breastfeeding or like 100 percent. and it, obviously if they've had cleft affected babies they're gonna be a lot more informed on that i didn't have anyone in the area that i knew know of anyway that breastfeeds with cleft affected, but I think that would have been, you know, beneficial even while I was pregnant, just that extra knowing you're not alone, like you said in the beginning of the podcast, it really mm -hmm. helps just having somebody say, hey, I did that too, and this is how I did it, or it didn't work for me, and this is why, and then just hearing other people's experiences, even if they failed, can help you become better at the thing yeah next time yeah yeah for sure I totally agree with that 
So now your daughter is will be eight months soon, right? right? Has she had surgery yet? Is she post op already? Yeah, they actually did it really early. Two months. She was only two months old when they did her lip surgery, and for us, the sur when she first had the surgery, it looked better. It's gotten a little worse over time. The scarring has, you can tell more now than you could at first. I don't know how to describe that the right way, but. Yeah, I've seen some images where like they, they'll become raised a little bit. Right. That's exactly Or a little pinched. That's what it looks like a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting. The cleft mom question of the week is about scarring. We'll hold, I will hold your thoughts on that. <laughs> and are you still breastfeeding? Yes, I am. I'm so proud because like I said, with my other two, I was not successful, and I just am so proud of myself because you just got to stick with it. It's really, yeah. really hard, and but I know with the palate, it's even more discouraging, but I get it, and I encourage pumping as much as you can, too. Pumping is a whole other game, okay, because not <laughs> all pumps are made the same. If it, any mom, if you, I don't know if you've pumped before, but not all pumps are made the same. And there's lots of things <laughs> that, it, that you have to go, get over with pumping too. Because it's oh, for sure. a whole other job, like dishes, everything, sterilizing, storing. Yeah. Yeah, my neighbor, she's she said, she was spot on. She said it's a labor of love and it truly is. It's. One of those things. So I pumped for about four months and my daughter, she had a lot of like reflux and stuff. And she was, I think now that I know better, it's not really just her. It's really a lot of um, children that are cleft affected have a lot of reflux and just gas in general. So she was like throwing up a lot. But I noticed that it was more with her, with the breast milk that I was giving her. And then I'm like, oh, do I really want to go on an elimination diet on top of having to like just go to all these appointments and stuff when she was first born? So it was just really tough to maintain it. And so I started supplementing and then eventually I just weaned her. And so I just stopped pumping and of course I, I dried out. But it was difficult. I tried to do it as long as I possibly could. And I had, in the beginning, I had a lot. I had a lot of, I was pumping a lot. I, I was getting a lot of milk as well. And it was something that I was like really proud of, but it's definitely hard. It's something that really is like I commend those mothers that really stick to that. Because as you said, pumping is also, it's different, right? It's not the same thing as like nursing or, or breastfeeding because it's another task, like another type of like task that you have to do. Um, you should but yeah. be proud, Laura. So just so you know, <laughs> be very proud because pumping is not easy. Either it's formula feeding. I don't. I hate dishes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that because even the I feel like, oh, man, I, at least I wanted to make it to the six month mark. And then I'm like, I wanted to make it to the year mark at least. I wasn't able to do that. And sometimes I feel like, do I get credit for those four months? Oh, yes. It's a long, it's a long time. Of course you do. That is full time. And you know what? Every ounce of breast milk counts and goes towards your baby's immunity and your immu their immune system. And it's so good for them. You did what yes. you did and whatever you did was the best for your baby. But really, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So how long are do you, are you feeling like you're going to, to breastfeed? I think I'm going to do the long haul. Like She's getting on solids now, so I have been producing a little less than I was before. But yeah, I'm going to do it until she weans off. And whatever. Until she weans off herself, yeah. yeah. As long as... Oh, okay. <laughs> And so through her surgery, you mentioned that you gave her, I can't remember if you told me this before we started recording or after, right. but you gave her one bottle during her recovery process. And so how did you, how were you able to continuously breastfeed through recovery? I find that's like really the mo one of the most challenging times oh my, for us. It was so hard during her surgery. I was engorged because she, baby wants to eat after lip surgery, right? 
Um, yes. Want to do it because they're in pain. It's so heartbreaking. But eventually she did. But I had to give her the bottle because I just, my, my heart was breaking for her. She was mm. being bloody murder. And I felt like the bottle was more comfortable for her because she didn't have to try as much to get the mm. lat. Because it just falls into her mouth rather than where she had to latch onto my breast and really must get my let down to go. So I was getting my let down to go before I would put my breast in her mouth to make it easier. And that's how I dealt with it for the first week or so when she had her surgery. Because she couldn't get my let down because her little mouth was in pain and I felt so bad. And their nose gets really clogged after their surgery. Mm -hmm. And babies do not like to not be able to breathe through their nose. <laughs> <laughs> they say bloody murder with that. <laughs> That's so interesting you say that because now, so my daughter, she's five months palate repair. And I find that she's now, I kept her home for the first year and now she's in daycare. So she's getting sicker more often than what she usually would but I find that she's just so stuffy I don't know whether it's just something but even when she's not sick I just find her to be like a snorer mm -hmm. she snores sometimes or she's just more congested I, I don't know so that's another thing that I'm gonna probably talk to like maybe her ENT about to see what's if that's normal so yeah but what do you think is um, something that you wish people knew about children with uh, cleft palates in, in general? I wish they knew that it's a lifelong journey. Because mm. Everybody always says to me, oh, she'll have this surgery and then everything will be fine and dandy. And nobody will even know. And as much as that's great that nobody would know if she had cleft or not, she will know and there's lifelong struggles with having cleft there's lots of syndromes that go along with cleft there's like we just said sinus problems that you don't intend to get orthodontics like you were talking about in the starting with mm. i really worry about that because my daughter has a gum knot as well and she hasn't got any teeth yet so i don't know where her teeth are going to be at this point in time. There's just so many things that you have to deal with later in life. Also with the cleft lip is the collapsed nose and the scar. And when you're a girl, I have teenagers, so I know at some point she's going to really care about how she looks. And I really worry about that for her. And I wish people wouldn't say, Lisa's just cleft and she'll get the surgery and everything will be fine. I wish they knew that it's a lifelong struggle and lifelong recovery, really. It's been consistent in the conversations that I've had with people is that I guess like others um, that haven't been impacted by this, they don't realize how much of your anatomy is involved and that your nose is involved, your ears are involved, just those types of things that impact your quality of life. And having that basic understanding, I think, would allow people to have a little bit more empathy and, and to understand that it isn't just cosmetic, right? It's right. not just like this easy, quick fix. That's the That's like the very uh, basic level of all of the things that they'll have to go through. And speaking of going through this like journey, what do you feel has been the hardest part of your journey? Just acceptance that it's not my failure. I'm one of the people it, like with my other two kids too, I blame myself for everything. I just want to be a good mom. And that's the hardest part of my journey is just trying to be a good mom and yeah. do the best I can. And we're all just doing the best we can. Yeah. With what we oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that it, because it, it, like it almost brings me to tears to even think about that because it's such a simple thing to say. But it's like 
the hardest thing is that you just want to be the best mom. That is the thing, right? I know yeah. you're making me want to cry. <laughs> but i'm grateful for this this platform that so many people have allowed me to speak with them and you've shared your journey today so i'm happy about that i do want to ask answer a question of the week for another mom that maybe we can help before we both start crying right (laughs) and then we won't be any help to anyone (laughs) so this question in particular is about scarring and it just says, does anyone have any suggestions or on something for scars? Our surgeon didn't prescribe anything when we saw him after surgery, just vitamin E, but we're not really happy with the results. Any recommendations? I can say the exact same thing happened to me. My plastic surgeon <laughs> told me not to use anything and to make sure that she had sunscreen when we go outside because the sun is one of the worst things for scars. It'll make it red. But he said the best thing you could do is massage. So that is what I've been trying to do religiously. As we all know, that's a very difficult thing to do to a baby that just had surgery. But we do it because we just want to be the best moms. (laughs) (laughs) So they tell you to do it right after surgery, like as soon as you can? It was healed, I think, in mm. six weeks, I think. Yeah, I um, I have heard the sunscreen recommendation as well. I've seen so many different recommendations online, though. Like, I don't, I would really love to see, I don't know, like something sp- like a specific thing. But I guess, I guess like all children are different. I don't really have recommendation because my daughter wasn't lip affected. But what I will say just for scars in general, like, I I guess like the keeping it moisturized is one of the things that I've heard like before. Me. The massages as well. And I've also heard about the sunscreen is really helpful. Now, for the massages, right, since you were breastfeeding, maybe this is a dumb question, but did that help at all? I I asked him, I said, is this breastfeeding helping her because like her muscles and everything? And he said, oh, I don't really know because I don't know anything about breastfeeding and cleft. So I've really been on my own on this journey. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it does. I can. I think it does, personally. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it does. There has to be something to that. Maybe maybe someone else that like listens to this episode will be able to share like some proof of that. But yeah. So what is the what is the biggest lesson that you've learned along your journey? Definitely follow your intuition. Like (laughs) they say, don't you can't breastfeed and you think you can just do it. Just try. There's no. You can't fail by just trying. You just got to do it and learn on your own. Yeah, don't lose that determination, right? Yeah. We want to be the best we can for our child. That's all there is to it. Follow your intuition because you might think there's something there with your child that somebody else doesn't see because you're with your child every day. So you follow that gut feeling, that intuition. Because it'll always guide you the right way. Yeah. That brings me to another question. What do you, what is the best advice that you've received as a mother? This could be like as a a mother of a club child or just just, as a mother in general. Yeah. The best advice. Oh, that's a hard one, Lord. (laughs) (laughs) I do really feel strongly about following your intuition. I think that would be some of the best advice I ever gotten was go with your gut. You'll get advice from a million different people, but you have to decipher for yourself what pieces of those advice that you put together for yourself and what works best for you and your child. Yes, for sure. I think in thinking of this question myself, I think cherishing the moments would probably like being present in the moment with your child as well is a a big one that I got everybody used to say they're not going to be she's not going to be little forever 
And I wish that I am the mom that I am today is the mom that I wish that she had when she was first born. Ooh. But I'm also like, I've learned so many different things now. So I'm I'm different. Oh. She's made me different. <laughs> You're so it's true. You're, I love it. But that time has passed. Yeah. yeah I totally get that sentiment with the teenage kids. So, yeah. Yeah. But oh, okay, so I feel like this has been such a wonderful conversation, Sarah. I just want to thank you so much for just being a part of the po- this podcast and just like really sharing your daughter's story with me. It's an honor to to hear it and and listen to it. And so, thank you so much. And again, thank you all for listening to the Our Forever Smiles. Uh, Clef Mom Diaries and Support Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and submit a review of the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. I hope that you've enjoyed this audio experience. Maybe you cried a little, laughed a little, but more importantly, I hope that you feel a little piece of reassurance and even joy in your journey. Talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.